Hi, today we're talking to Julia Reed, renowned author and journalist. Julia Reed is the author of numerous books, including But Mama Always Put Vodka in the Sangria, a contributing editor at Garden and Gun magazine, where she writes a regular column called The High and the Low. She's an editor at El Decor and the food columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Her book, But Mama Always Put Vodka in the Sangria, is hilarious. A collection of essays from a master of the art of eating, drinking, and making merry. And in this episode, we discuss a new study that's important, that's come out about the health benefits of making merry and why we need to do it. Julia, thanks so much for coming today. Thank you for having me. This is so much fun. So I want to talk to you about but mama always put vodka in the sangria. <laughs> First of all, I did not know prior to this that you could put vodka in sangria. Well, I didn't either until I drank this particular vodka. <laughs> okay, so we're, this is what we're doing today. So would you like to mix it up for us? The recipe is in the book and Julia's going to I will. put it and all I together mean, for us. I mean, as I said, most people, um, well, first you dump all this delicious fruit into the pitcher. Okay. Most people, as you know, or as you may not know, but most people think of sangria as just a little wine, lots of this yummy fruit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and some ice. And my mother's best friend, who's the mother actually in this particular thing, I'm making a big mess, That's um, right. was a sort of high living, fun, loving person and a great entertainer. And she always, we didn't know that she'd put vodka in the sangria. We just know it was really good and powerful. <laughs> but one time I gave a party and I came out and uh, everybody was sort of falling in the bushes. And so I asked her daughter, my, one of my good friends, I said, what did you put in that sangria? And she said, vodka. Oh my. This is actually a really, this is a Rioja. A good, strong red wine is okay. a good thing to do. It's been breathing since this morning. Is that good? <laughs> That's good. It's good. It's good. Okay. All right, here, we don't, I, Ann Ross, my mother's friend who I write about in the book a lot, put like a liter of vodka in the book, I mean in, in the sangria. We're not doing that because we want, want people bags. to be able to stand up a yes. little bit. You know, well, what we want is we want what's good for us. So moderate, you know, yes. most of the studies say moderate alcohol. Right. Is well, this too was a much little, will this, kill your brain yes. cells. And this but. is a little rum in here. Okay. Now I got, the, I added that to this recipe because Danny Meyer, who's a great restaurateur and owns the Union Square Cafe and Gramercy Cavern and all these fabulous restaurants in New York, he has a, a drinks book called Mick Shake Stir, I think. And mm -hmm. he, um, it's all the drinks from his restaurants. And he added rum to his, so I thought, well, well if Danny Meyer can do that, I'm gonna add that with the vodka. Yeah. Now, this is a this is a traditional ingredient. <laughs> the brandy, brandy or cognac or anything like that. Okay. The vodka and the rum actually, because ideally you would let this, this will be a lot better tomorrow when you have some people over. So it lasts that long. It la oh yeah, it's, it it's better. You can you soak it overnight. You have to make it and hide it. Yes, you have to make it and hide it. It's good overnight because all this fruit and stuff settles takes in, in all the and alcohol. you know you can sort of smash up the pineapple or you could add a little pineapple juice Look how but gorgeous when, that is. when you do it the vodka and the rum actually sort of take the sweetness edge off and so okay okay and it gives it a little kick you want a little kick you don't want to be thinking you're tasting kool-aid i'm a little scared no after all right so then after it's all over we dump a little ice and I try not to destroy your kitchen okay because we need it to get cold all right, I'm going to try this. I'm going to take this beautiful but very fragile stir we have here. <laughs> we give you the fragile tool, tools to play with. Nobody's ever accused me of being a sort of light-handed mix <laughs> mixer. Um, all right, so now, let's see, and this would be perfect on a summer day. Yes. The picture would be all, you know, Yes, and you could put it up so the light would shine yep. through it. Okay, so. This is a heck of a mixture in here, isn't it? This is. A, so I'm just going to give you a little sip. Yes. And if you're so serving at a party, myself. we'd like throw some of this fruit in, maybe get some mint going on there, and it'd be beautiful. Yes. But watch out, because the last time Mama put vodka in the sangria, <laughs> like I said, I walked out of my own house, and I said, what in the world? Because everybody was sort of talking too loud and laughing too <laughs> Hard and sort of, you know, falling into the bushes. So let's try it. Okay. All right, here we go. Chin chin. When it's when oh, the oh, it's yummy. It is yummy, oh, but this good. fruit, but you want this fruit to be sitting in it for a while. Yes, I understand. So hang on to it. So and it's not party sweet tomorrow. at all. And oh, it's got an afterburn. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't get you at the back of the throat, but it's got it's got a chest burn. You know that you have a little bit more than some red wine and fruit in here. <laughs> oh my goodness. <laughs> so talk to me a little bit about the beginning of this book. Tell goes into one. Is first of all, it's hilarious. Thank I you. mean, I just I 
laughed again at like every paragraph I think I was taken aback by that I wasn't expecting it to be so funny but so tell me about your childhood the families <laughs> the the parties who has time for all these parties well and where I grew up in the Mississippi Delta it's a pretty rural spot but it was always fairly sophisticated because it was a riverboat town we were you know we were on the Mississippi um it was uh founded by a bunch of farmers who came late, not all that long before the Civil War, and they had already farmed in other places and the land had kind of tapped out. So this is a hugely rich alluvial floodplain, and so all these crazy people, you had to be kind of a gambler to decide to hack out this wilderness. Um, huh. this fer but it was worth it to get to this fertile land, and so it's late in the game. We were, not everybody was sitting around like Tara and Gone with the Wind. You That's know? my picture. Yeah. I'm thinking Scarlet No, no, Empire. no, no, no. Yeah. These are sort of rough and tumble people who were really, you know, decided to take a gamble and trying to make a living and doing it pretty well because once you got to this, uh, this, this land sort of dried out and quit flooding, it was, it was worth it. But um, so, you know, there were some great characters who came and settled first, and, and, but it was like the wilderness for a long time. I mean, right. you know, you go from farm to farm, and it would be, I mean, in early, in early, you know, in the sort of mid to late 19th century, I found all these diaries and stuff when I was researching another book. And um, Have you used those in another book? A bit. There's a bit of it in, in my first book, Queen of the Turtle Derby, which is, is essays about the South. But, you know, these guys, they, they were all well-educated and pretty well off, and they were down there, and it's like, now what do we do? So they would, like, they would get on. The first thing they built was, like, little bitty railroads from, like, farm to farm and little town to little town to, so they could go to each other's houses and have parties because it was the only way. I mean, otherwise you're just kind of looking... Right, at some at fertile yourself. fields <laughs> and um, watching the cotton grow. So, okay. um, so it was early on that was like a tradition of sort of wild partying because if you got to somebody's house, you didn't want to leave right away, so you'd stay for these three and four day mad house parties. I mean, one of the diaries has like the water coming in because there are a lot of floods before right. the Corps of Engineers finally built some real levees. Um, and so. He was talking about how they'd raise the piano onto the second floor so the music wouldn't stop when the water came into the first oh my floor. Goodness. And it's still a little madcap like that. Yeah, so that, that, that madcap yeah. definitely comes across. Because in the, even in, in my hometown, which is a fairly sophisticated place, and it was even more sophisticated when I was growing up because the port was still really um, sort of active, um, you know, there's a really famous steakhouse called Doe's Eat Place. But it is like, you know, you go and you get hot tamales, steak and like french fries and fried shrimp and that's it you take your own booze because unbeknownst to me until i got old and figured it out we were dry this whole state of mississippi was dry you until could not 66. buy yes yes you did your homework i mean who knew i mean i certainly didn't know because everybody i knew was drinking I all the time i was three <laughs> then i know and you were at the mercy of what your bootlegger would yeah, bring you yeah. i love which, which drain thank god well then. thank god i mean you know it was fairly decent brands i mean there was like this you know john handy scotch which i've never seen anywhere else um, I think it costs $5 a bottle, but I just thought that everybody's liquor store delivered, which they do in most big cities. So. <laughs> well, what, I mean, they're, they're, all the essays in here are really fascinating in their own right. The Thank detail you. that you go into, um, there's one in particular about um, scotch and the difference between scotch and bourbon, which I did not know. And just the, the um, I felt expanded after having read Well, them. I try to, I mean, writing about food, I mean, when I started writing about food years ago for the New York Times Magazine, sort of accidentally, I mean, I'm not a classical sort of food writer. Like, I'm not going to sit here and dissect these ingredients or, you know, talk about the heritage of the green apple in there. I mean, because after a while, food just in itself, there ain't a whole lot no, to say about right, it, you know? Right. And so, you know, if I'm writing about food, what I'm really writing about is the experiences you have around the table. Yes. I like to give people a little info because I love learning about it. I mean, like, I, you know, when I was writing a column, that, that piece on bourbon that you referenced was a short, and it's very much more truncated version, was in um, a Newsweek column that I wrote. And I, so I sort of did some research about the whole history of bourbon in this country. And I had always drunk scotch because, like you said, that's what the bootlegger <laughs> had more of <laughs> and better brands, apparently, than bourbon. So my father just kept the house stocked with scotch. But, I, you know, now bourbon is this huge, huge fad. I mean, I was in a restaurant last night in New York where they have, like, 300 kinds of bourbon on oh, hand. Oh, wow. Um, but, you know, so I like to give you a little bit of history or some stuff behind but all But it's not this. dry. I mean, but the, also, the my first impression was when you, you're writing about 
your family and your extended family and how much fun you had and how you know eccentric some of these people are <laughs> and I and the parties and I thought I want a life like this I want it was a pretty good like, growing up was we had a lot of fun and I still have fun I mean I you know it, it's but so my mother, yeah, so we lived in this place, and my mother and her best friend, who is the mother that always put the vodka in the sangria, um, had great parties all the time. And and the Mississippi Delta also was sort of a political hotbed, and everything was sort of changing when I was growing up there. So you had all these people coming through. You yes. know? My father would say, um, you know, William F. Buckley Jr., who's a columnist and is coming to dinner, my mother would say, thanks a lot for that big heads up, you know, and be like, the and, next, the, and the VD spinach yeah, that's so, so that was, yeah, that's how VD, the whole VD dinner menu came alive. You have alive. to explain what that VD. I know, because VD, it's not, it's, it's not, not what it's you're not, thinking. it's not, it's not, it's uh, not, it's not a sexually transmitted disease. It stands for visiting dignitary. Visiting dignitary. Because there would be all these different journalists and stuff, and I think that's why I decided to become a writer. I'd seen how much fun these journalists were having coming through. Oh, and really? Quote, unquote, reporting on what was going on, but right. really Basically being thrown having, par parties. Yeah, having parties thrown for them. That was the olden days. That's <laughs> yeah. not the case no, now, No, it's right? not. Although, um, but the VD dinners live on, but it's visiting dignitary. So Mama and, and, and her friend, Ann Ross, Figured out early on they better have like a go-to menu just to pull out of their hats every time somebody would turn up and my father would say, we're having 50 people over for dinner. And so the VD spinach is, it's, I've put that in um, in three books now because it's because like it's one so of, popular. it's a great, it's a great recipe. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was in the New York Times cookbook when they did the, redid, you know, the new revised version. And I could tell Amanda Hester, who I love, was the editor, but she's much more of a serious food person than I am. And she was aghast that it had like you know that type Philadelphia of and also Philadelphia cream cheese oh, and right. some yes, store bought ingredients. Yeah. I've made it like you know the whole thing homemade with everything bechamel sauce, you name it. Yeah. Not nearly as good. Really, but just for the name, just for <laughs> the know, name, you have to try it out. You it's have worth to try the book. It. Is worth buying it. Just I'm for that telling recipe. you, it is. But um, but anyway, so that's I had some good mentors in in learning how to throw parties, and also because we had to sort of make our own fun down there in the swamps. Um. <laughs> We have so many friends who are musicians. I am like the only person I know that cannot play anything. But huh. so, can we, you sing? Not well, but there are enough people singing loudly enough around me that I don't mind out. throwing in. But I mean, I'll, you know, I have so many good friends who play the piano and the guitar and who are singers. And you know, we've got great blues musicians that are still around there. So everybody kind of gets parties. impromptu musicals after dinner. Right. I mean, there's a piece in there about about uh, about that called Happy Enchilada. Which is so complicated, you'll have to just read it. But yeah. <laughs> why it's called Happy Enchilada. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, even like when Bill Buckley came down, he was a great pianist, and I remember having to go to bed at that party finally at midnight and, and not being able to sleep because he's singing, like, you know, banging out Steely really? Joe Lindo at the piano, and like, the, but then there's some farmer accompanying him on the guitar. There's That's always a funny. mixture. I mean, it's nice that my column at Garden and Gun is called The High and the Low because mm -hmm. there's always a mixture of high and low at those parties. Right, a real mixture. And well, that was very appealing, that image that you gave of the multi generational parties. I thought that was charming. Yeah, we were, I mean, is like. Is that very southern? It is very yeah. southern, I think. I mean, you know, it's like everybody's just sort of up in the house together. I mean, yeah. And in rural areas in general in this country, and you know, not until all, not all that long ago, multi generations would live in the same house. I mean, like yeah. my both my each of my parents grew up in houses with their grandparents yeah, and their parents too. and their Even siblings. The yeah, yeah, and, and you know, I, and even now that you know, when I was growing up, that had passed. But like all of our neighbors and these good, this, you know, these good friends that I write about all the time, we were like extended family. Mm. And we just, our mothers would throw us up in the house together and we, you know, and just... Have so much fun. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us about um, Garden and Gun magazine. It's a wonderful magazine, uh, founded not all that long, several years ago. It's based in Charleston, but it covers the whole South. All my Yankee friends love it because they just yeah. like the novelty value of having Garden and Gun magazine so on their, on right, their coffee right, table. Right. Yes, it's controversial, <laughs> yeah. right? So, so that's us north of the Mason-Dixon line, is that right? The Yankees are yeah yes well, that's the cultural divide <laughs> pretty much but I mean you know uh, uh, we have honorary Southerners all over the place yeah do you you strike me that you would be one <laughs> <laughs> well, my my uh, sister-in-law lives in North Carolina and my brother well, that certainly counts was born in Mobile, Alabama. Which so, is not very far from where I live now, in, in New Orleans. When, oh, okay, so when I read what you said about um, the people, redneck. people oh. who put sugar in their cornbread <laughs> are either imposters or criminals or both, <laughs> I called him. 
to oh, ask mean you. girls. I thought, let me find out. Because <laughs> I don't have a reference point for Southerners. Yeah. You know, I don't really know. I came here when I was 30, so I don't... I know of it, but I don't quite get it. What did so he say? So he said that his mama never put sugar in the cornbread. Good. But that his <laughs> Yankee wife, who is my sister-in-law... <laughs> doesn't like it because she's used to the sweeter cornbread that yeah. tastes more like cakes. Right. So that was fascinating. And yeah, the real rural cornbread, which is how cornbread started. Now you can have every kind of corn, Mexican cornbread, which doesn't exist in Mexico. It, it, you know, it exists in the Junior League cookbooks in Mississippi. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, you know, but it's, it is, you can tell sort of cultural divides in the South. I mean, everybody thinks the South, we are not one monolithic place from mm -hmm. below the Mason-Dixon line on. It's sort of like Bosnia. I mean, you know, you've got... Even in Mississippi, I mean, if you leave the Delta and go into the hills, we're still like, we don't we don't see eye to eye. Right, They're right, Baptist right. and don't drink, and Mama did not put vodka in the sangria or anything else. You know? no, that wasn't happening. That's <laughs> no, right. no, 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 no. Okay. So, we were bad guys in the Delta, bad actors. Okay. So Garden and Gun Magazine, is it is it about guns? Well, it's about, that's you know, in fact, it was named after a nightclub in Charleston that was a great mix of the high and the low. I went one time. When I went to visit a friend of mine who, uh, from boarding school who lived there, and her sort of reprobate uncle snuck us in, sneaked us into the bar, and, and it was, I remember it just being like, you know, it was near sort of the water, so you'd have these sort of sailors on leave, and then you'd have all and how these old proper, were you? I, we, yeah, we were 18, we were plenty of them, okay. I certainly knew how to drink. Um, there were all these sort of proper Charlestonians and their Gucci's and no socks, and then there'd be all these sort of debutantes, and then there'd be transvestites. So it was this great mix wow. of folks, and I, the founders of the magazine knew that would be a private joke and nobody would really get it, but in their heads, it was a good sort of guiding principle to be this great okay. mix of different kinds of people. So Okay, and always so great when you're entertaining yourself, it's going to guarantee you're entertaining someone else. Oh, yeah. So if they were tickling themselves with that title. Well, exactly, yeah. and that's the whole driving premise of my book. I mean, I entertain not... I can, it's so clear. I mean, it's generosity toward other people, yeah, but really yeah. I'm entertaining myself. Yeah, this is a party in a book. If your life is dull, <laughs> if you're not having enough fun, you can follow this like a guidebook Thank for you. how to put fun back in your life. I mean, it's really... It, I hope it, so. It will tick that box. So now, your food column in the Wall Street Journal. I just started writing one. It'll be probably, you know, every few weeks or so. We don't have like a set thing. But uh -huh. I love the weekend section of the Wall Street Journal. The off-duty section is so much fun. And, they, and my good friend, Jay McInerney, who's a great wine critic, writes a wine column for them. And, and they have fun, fashion things. Rita Koenig, who's a great... British um, young decorator from London, whose uh, mother, Nita Campbell, is a really well-known decorator. Mm -hmm. Anyway, Rita writes some fun home decor stuff. I mean, there's lots of, you know, there's lots of sort of um, fun cultural stuff in there. And so... Is there um, a focus in your food column? Well, it's just, just the ranging? same as this. It's like whatever is on my little mind that Which day. Which is perfect. Well, I mean, that's the personality. My first one was on Easter lunches. And again, it was sort of like... There's only so much you can say about what to have at Easter. I mean, okay, we can have lamb, we can have asparagus, we can right. have some peas, whatever. But so it was an it was an opportunity for me to sort of remember some of the wilder or more daring Easter lunches that I had. That okay. Fun things happened, and again, I'm entertaining myself because I'm having these really funny mem memories. And then um, the second one I did was about this really good friend of mine, Donald Link, who's a brilliant chef based in New Orleans, but he's, I think he's one of the best chefs by far in the country. And he just opened up a new restaurant. So we took... A, What's the restaurant called? It's called Pesh, and it's um, all about seafood. So we took a sort of zany road trip down the Gulf Coast to this buy... Is so, <laughs> this is so a web series. This is a web series, or it's a, it's a reality show. <laughs> no, I mean, can't you just see it? I can see you like, um, like Anthony Bourdain or, you know, doing your own... Anthony Bourdain has way too much fun. I'm so jealous of him. He has so much I fun. I know. I know. I know. But you I would know. be brilliant for something like this. Well, I have a pretty good time, I have to say. And I do. I still love giving parties. And my mother still has um, great parties. And, and I go home a lot just to sort of be reminded by the masters that were my own mentors. Okay. Keep having. you in your place. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. so going forward in the future, you've got your columns. Um, what is there another book underway? Oh, I'm sure, you know, my, my, my editor at St. Martin's, who's my publisher on my food books, is a, is a determined, he's just a passionate foodie, and he's always determined to, to, we should collaborate on another book because it's his excuse for us to go dying really well all over the place while we discuss how we're going to do this. But, um, <laughs> tough, so tough he's, work. he's wonderful. So we, I'm sure I'll do another, um, another collection of food pieces. And, you know, because 
I'll write little snippets that turn into bigger essays in the book. I mean, like one of those, I mean, a couple of the essays in there were things I wrote for Garden and Gun, but in book form, I can flesh it out and yes, right, throw in lots right. more recipes. Right. I have a good time testing the recipes because that's another excuse to have a party. I have to invite people <laughs> over like, y'all, I'm testing the recipes for the Wall Street Journal or Garden and Gun or whatever, so I have to... Well, I think there's um, there's an element of the instruction manual in it because there was one line that really struck me last night. Um, there was a like a kids pasta dinner here, <laughs> and at first I was thinking, oh my goodness, we've got to get clean for. And then I thought, no, because you say in here back to back parties because you've already cleaned <laughs> yeah. and the flowers are still fresh. And I and so that was helpful. And I think people don't know how to have parties in a good time anymore. We're all working so hard. No, so, I know. I mean, it's you know we. One of the things in the Delta, especially if you get people to come for an event from out of town, like, you know, my big 40th birthday party or mm -hmm. when I get married. So you've got people flying in from all over the world, literally. It's not easy to get to Greenville, Mississippi. So once you get there, you got to entertain them all the time because, like I said, there's like a great steakhouse that's legendary, but, you know, you're not going to eat there for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Right. So you take them to Doe's and then you're sort of like, okie doke. Oh. So you have to have back-to-back -back parties. I mean, you've got them for dinner and then, okay, now it's time for brunch. Okay. And, Okay. And if you, you know, brides never leave at their <laughs> wedding because they stay, it's too much fun. They stay the next day for the wedding brunch because why should the guests have all the fun? Oh my goodness. So if you have an event coming up, if you want to know how to be the hostess with the mostest, this is ideal for you. And I thank you very much. Thank Julia, you for so much today. for having me. It's been me. great fun. And um, thank you. Enjoy the vodka. I mean, the, the vodka and the sangria tomorrow. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for joining us.